Hello everybody and welcome back to another video. This evening I'll be reading a part of Caledonia by George Chalmers and this in this book he proves the origins of all these families like the Stuarts, the Bruces, the Douglases, even the Wallaces were connected to Normans and the English. Sad to say it guys, William Wallace was probably an Englishman. They reckon Welsh to try and keep that Celtic side, but he was probably an Englishman. So uh, all those Wallace fanboys, uh, I'm sorry to say, but he was probably an Englishman fighting for his land. And this 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 was the problem. When David I came back into Scotland, there was a weird schism in Scotland. It went from the Irish Scoto kings to these Norman kings. When David I came in, he, he brought in lots of Norman knights with him, and he granted them all swathes of land all over Scotland. And um, these landowners had the people living on their land and the people to live on their land had to fight for these landowners. So any battle comes up, the landowner gathers the men from, from the land. And the men didn't really want to fight, but they had to, to stay on the land. And this is where this feudalism, this Scottish feudalism, and for some reason, these, these names are still around. These All these names are still on the land today in Scotland. And um, you've got a lot of fanboys and there's a lot of distorted history, especially in the, the modern media with Braveheart and the Outlaw King and promoting people like Bruce. And these were all Norman, these were all... There's nothing we can do now, but what we need to recognise is these were foreigners ruling over and subjugating the common person. You never hear about the common people. Even Wallace, they make out he's some kind of common man and the hero of the people when he was really another noble another Norman noble that was brought into Britain after the conquest of England. And um, Scotland really got, a thousand years ago, Scotland really got taken over by foreigners. And um, today we've, we've kind of lost that. We've, we, we kind of propped up these Jacobites and these Bonnie Prince Charlies and Mary Queen of Scots and Robert the Bruce and William Wallace. And the Scottish people are so deluded about their own history. If they really look at it with honest eyes, uh, they could see that the, the proper the proper kings of Scotland died off long ago. And just like Shakespeare um, made this propaganda within Macbeth, the Macbeth play, um, demonising Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, it's the same crap. And, 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 and same in Macbeth, he even put stuff in there to try and make out that King James was the, was the rightful heir to Britain because he was connected to King Arthur, and Shakespeare tried to put all this stuff, even if it was Shakespeare who wrote the play. Who was it? Could it have been Francis, was it Francis Bacon? or Because it's funny how this King James Bible pops up at the same time, and then the Shakespeare. <clears throat> There's so much propaganda and so much deception back then, and nowadays it's, it's just a modern-day Shakespearean trick being played on us in, in Scotland with a saltire flag, um, David and the Normans brought the, the saltire, St Andrews. In Scotland, it, it wasn't St Andrew, it was St Columbus, who was the patron saint. As soon as St David came in, it changed to this Latin form, St Andrew, who was he a Greek. Um, just everything, the language changed, everything. We, we were taken over, now we celebrate it, we celebrate it. And th this drives a lot of like, Scottish independence. Like, today, there's a big debate in Scotland about independence, stuff like that, and... A lot of this stuff drives these people, like Braveheart and stuff like that, and they need to understand that they're, they're kind of deluded. Anyway, I'm going to read it from this book, which is it's a solid piece of historical documentation. It's got all the lines, all the, all the kings, all the, all the families. All the families you thought were Scottish, like the Douglases or the Frasers or the Rosses, though, they were all Normans, and they adopted the area name. So if you, if you were a knight that came from Normandy, Normandy and you had a different surname or you're known as somebody else, when you came to Scotland and you got granted land and just a Dugdale, suddenly you were the Douglases. Uh, that's what I mean. A lot of them are in Ross, in Ross, De Ross. A lot of these names I thought were Scottish, but they're hiding behind these family names, and they're still, these are the people that run, that own a lot of the land today, and run a lot of the world today, these people. Anyway, enough of my blabbering, 
Uh, I'll get to the book and I'll try and read it as good as I can because I've not read in a while. But since I came back from a little break from down south, William Wallace's uh, homeland down south in England, I've, I've had a rejuvenation. So let's have a wee look at this book, guys. Very interesting stuff. And it kind of, George Chalmers kind of says, without shame, that all these people are, are connected to Bruce. And I had somebody try and rebuke one of my my videos, my Edward I had more right to the, the the land, the Scottish land or the British land than Bruce did. And I still stand by that because Edward's families was long in, in Britain, long before the Bruce's or the Stuarts. They came on a couple of hundred years later um, and married into the Scottish royalty. But Edward's family were there a couple of hundred years before. So this is what I mean, that they probably had more say to the land, more right to the land than Bruce's, because they're all foreigners at the end of the day. Again, even the English, were, they, they retreated north. Again, they, they, they came into Scotland once the, the Normans came in, a lot of the Anglos came into Scotland. Um, so, anyway, I'm going, to, I'm going to read this read this book, and then you can say in the comments what you think. But, like I said, the Bruce's, if you trace them right back, they they came over during the Norman invasions. They're not they're not pure Scots, and, they, and a lot of them just married into the Scottish nobility. And it wasn't even the high Scottish nobility; it was like the little isles and stuff like that. But they managed to wringle their way in, and now we celebrate them as Scottish royalty. Right, guys. Anyway, connected with the Baylols, who were who were also not connected to Normans, in family and pretensions were the Bruces of Annadale. So even the Bruces were connected to the Baylors. Robert de Bruce, B-R-U-I-S, Bruce, so it's not even Bruce yet, was an opulent baron in Yorkshire at the early epoch of Doomsday Book. His son, Robert, appeared in the court of Henry I with Earl David, being nearly of the same age, and soon after the ascension of King David in 1124, he obtained from his bounty a grant of Annandale, as the Charter of David established a tenure by the sword, we may easily suppose that he brought with him into Annadale knights and yeomen from Yorkshire, as indeed might be shown by tracing to the source some respectable families in Dumfrieshire. Yet that great baron seems to have clung to Guysburn, where he was born. So here it's saying that the, the original Bruce, or Bruce, Bruce, the Bruce, was a Yorkshireman. He had lands in England. Yet this great baron seems to have clung to Guysburn, where he was born and where he was buried. When he died, an old and opulent man in 1141, his son Adam inherited his English estates and became the progenitor of the Bruces of Skelton. His younger, youngest son Robert enjoyed Annandale from the gift of his father and laid the foundation of the house of Bruce, Bruce in North Britain, so this is where Robert the Bruce gets his stem for, for this, this one that got his lands in Annandale. This Robert Bruss, B-R-U-S, Le Meschen, or Metschen, entered into a comp composition with the Bishop of Glasgow concerning several churches in Annandale. As the privileges of the Baron clash with the rights of the Bishop, this progenitor of the Scottish Bruces flourished under David I, Malcolm IV, IV and William the Lion. Yet, have the genealogists confounded this great baron, the protector of the monks of home cultrum, with his father Robert and his son Robert, and indeed seem to have been unconscious that he ever existed, though he appears very distinctly in the instructive pages of record. This liberal baron was succeeded by his son Robert, who married Isabel, the natural daughter of William the Lion, in 1183. This Robert copied the lib liberalities of his father by giving several churches in Annadale to the monks of Guysburn. But he did not live long. In 1191, William gave Isabel, the widow of Robert the Bruce, to Robert de Ross. De Ross. This is where the Rosses come from. De Ross. Robert the Bruce was succeeded by his son William, who died in 1215. So we're, we're still a few Bruces away before we get to Robert the Bruce. 
He was succeeded by his son, Robert Bruce, who married Isabel and the daughter of David, the Earl of Huntington. It was in con consequence of this marriage that their son, Robert, entered into competition for the crown and that their great-grandson ascended the throne. He copied the liberalities of his father to the monks by confirming their grants. He flourished under Alexander II. He died in 1245. His widow survived him till 1251. So... 1245, 12, about this date is when the Bruce's got into the Scottish Royals proper. So this is what I mean when I say Edward I probably had more claim to the land. And just like how the, the, the James was trying to convince people that the Stuarts were more connected to the land, if you look at the evidence and the, the lineages, you would see that Edward has more right and more connection to the land before the Bruce's. Maybe the Bruce's came in later and got connections to more distinguished parts of the, the land, but it, that's later on. Anyway. Um, and they were buried in the Abbey of Saltry near Stilton, which the second Simon de St. Liz, the Earl of Northampton and Huntington, had built. So there's another Norman, Simon de St. Liz. Definitely not a British or Celtic name. And this is the thing too, it's not like they came over and they, they blended in with the common people. They stuck to their own families, these Normans. They built castles, they stuck to their own. They were succeeded by their son Robert who had married in 1244, Christian, the daughter of Gilbert, Earl of Gloucester, and an able and strenuous baron acted a great part under Alexander III. In 1255 he was appointed one of the 15 regents of Scotland and he supported the English factions against the Common Party who opposed Henry III. So this is another instance where the Bruce's take the English side. In 1264, with John Cummin and John Bailow, he led the Scottish auxiliaries to the aid of Henry III of England. So, so Bruce, John Cummin and John Bailow, all claimants for the Scottish crown, all went to help Henry. In 1284, he concurred with the other magnate Scotia in promising to accept the Princess Margaret as a sovereign on the demise of Alexander III. In 1286, after that sad event, he entered into an association with several powerful barons to adhere to the person who should obtain the crown in right of blood from Alexander III. In the Parliament at Brigham in March 1290, he sat as Lord of Annandale with his son Robert, the Earl of Carrick. So this is Father Bruce and Son Bruce. And in the movie, it's obviously that guy that's got the, the leprosy. And so we're now kind of up to date with the Bruce's. In 1291, he entered into an unsuccessful competition with Balol for the crown. He now resigned his pretensions to his son, the Earl of Carrick. Ard, he died at Loch Maven Castle on Good Friday of the year 1295 at the patriarchal age of 85. He was succeeded by Robert, his son, who having accompanied Edward I to Palestine in 1269, was ever after greatly rewarded by the gallant prince. And it's almost like the, the Holy Land was Scotland, and once they'd won it in Scotland, they divided the land up. was ever after greatly regarded by the gallant prince. So Edward I greatly regarded Bruce's dad for fighting with him in the Holy Land. So they, they had a great bond, Bruce's dad and Edward I. There was a, a, a bond there. And like I said, these people could see, relate to each other more with each other than they could with the common man here. So I don't know why there's people out there that put these people on pedestals. when They, they would have flicked you away back in the day. But the great distinction of his life was his marriage with Margaret, the Countess of Carrick, in 1271, at his age of 27, and he became thereby Earl of Carrick. This is Robert Bruce. According to, I think this is Robert Bruce's dad, according to the courtesy of Scotland in that age. So the story is that uh, they were fighting in the Holy Land, and one of the knights died. He left a widow who was the Earl Lesser, or whatever it is over there, of Carrick, 
he got in there, married her, became involved in the Scottish, became more involved, more of a claim. This was all about land and claiming land. This was nothing but the Scottish people and freedom and all this garbage. It was all about land and domination and power. The Earl of Carrick acted during those eventful times a very splendid part, though he was perhaps of inferior talents to both his son and his father. He had the honour in 1278 to do homage for Alexander III for the English king, for his English lang lands. He engaged in 1284 with the other magnates of Scotland to acknowledge the Princess Margaret as successor of Alexander III. He sat in the Parliament of Br Brigham in 1290 with his father, though in a higher form as Earl of Carrick. He seemed to have lost his wife, the Countess, in 1292, who had brought him 12 children, and he thereupon resigned to his eldest son, who was still underage, the Earldom of Carrick, with every pretension which he held by courtesy in the right of his wife as Earl. So he seemed to have lost his wife somewhere. Whoops. I'll get in there, marry her and lose her. Whoops. Because I didn't really fall in love with her, and the, 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 the marriage was just for power, for land. The late Earl of Carrick and his heir swore fealty to Edward I in August 1296. Robert Bruce, the father, died in 1304 when Robert, the Earl of Carrick, obtained livery of his lands in England. After several submissions and reiterated re renunciations, the Earl of Carrick was chosen one of the guardians of Scotland for Balliol in 1299. The Bishop of St Andrew and John Cummin, the younger, whom... He slew at Dumfries on the 10th of February 1306 and after various actions which evince that they were dictated by the occasion while his eyes were fixed steadily on the crown Robert Bruce, the Earl of Carrick at the age of 33 became King of Scots on the 27th of March 1306 and the Baloyal family probably had a a closer connection to the, the Scottish line than the, the Bruce's as well. This is why he stabbed them and got rid of them. Anyway, from those investigations with regard to the Bruce's, we are naturally conducted to researches concerning the Stuart family, whose true origin has hitherto defied the most curious researches. Lord Hales has succeeded in proving that those various histories are nothing more than fabulous genealogies, without being able to determine when and what was the commencement of the family of the Stuarts. And like the, 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 the Stuarts, they've, they've put so much lies into the culture that we've somehow accepted. Even the, the, they called them the, the Pretender, Bonnie Prince Charlie, the Pretender, turned up speaking different language. People, the Scottish people were like, who the hell is that? And who's, who's this guy? And he's wiggling and he's, oh, follow me. Oh, Jesus. And we've still got them here following, following the sheep. Right. Yet his lordship acknowledges that Walter, who flourished under David I, and his ex successor Malcolm IV, was indeed the Stuart of Scotland. But the difficult question still remains unanswered of what family was this real personage. He uniformly speaks of himself and is spoken of by others as Walter, the son of Alan. Yet, who this Alan was is a very embarrassing inquiry, which no one has hitherto pretended to answer. If we accept the fablers who pretend to give a regular succession of various Walters and Alans from Eth, the King of Scots, who reigned during the 8th century. I propose to show from the most satisfactory evidence that Walter, the son of Alan, came from Shropshire in England, that he was the son of Alan, the son of Flald, and the younger brother of William, the son of Alan, who was the progenitor of the famous house of Fitzalan, the Earls of Arundel. So guys, I, I thought the Earls the, the Earls of Fitzalan? Who, who's, who's Fitzalan? So I put in Fitzalan and before I even started reading who the Fitzalans were, were, the first thing that caught my eye was this on the right. And this is a line rampant. It's used by the Bruces, it's used by the Stuarts. So there's no doubt the, sim the symbolism is there telling us that these Fitzalans are connected to the Stuarts and the Bruces. And they were English, by the way, so for all those fanboys of Bruce and everything, they're English. 
Oh, and anyway, I'll read. I'll read a little bit about them anyway. Fitz Allen is an English patronymic surname of Anglo-Norman origin, descending from the Breton king Alan Fitzflard in 1120, who accompanied King Henry the First to England on his succession. He was grandson of the sentinel of the Bishop of Dol. The Fitzalan family shared a common patronal ancestry with the House of Stuart. The Fitzalans held the earldom of Arundel from 1267 to 1580. Variants of the surname include Fitzalan, 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 Fitzalan. The noble family of bearing the surname would eventually abandon their patronymic in favour of a toponymic surname. Arundel or Arundel, a reference to their title in the peerage of England, but the use of Fitzalan's surname is often retained in historical literature. And that's really all you've got. Oh, wait a You've got origins as well, but the controversy over Stuart ancestry. So I'll leave a link in the description to this stuff if you want to look more into the Fitzalan's. Right, the great exploit of Walter, the son of Alan, was the founding of the monastery of Paisley during the reign of Malcolm IV by transplanting a colony of Cluniac monks from the monastery of Wenlock in Shropshire. Such then was the connection of Walter, the first Stuart with Shropshire, with Wenlock, with Isabel de Say, who married William, the brother of Walter. Alan, the son of Flald, married the daughter of Warren, the famous sheriff of Shropshire, Soon after the Norman conquest and of this marriage, William was the eldest son of Alan and the undoubted heir of both Alan and Warren. Alan, the son of Flald, a Norman, acquired the manor of Oswestry in Shropshire soon after the conquest. Alan was undoubtedly a person of great consequence at the ascension of Henry I. He was a frequent witness to the King's charters with other eminent personages of that splendid court. I will now prove the frick fraternal connection between William, son of Alan, and Walter, son of Alan, by a transaction which is new to history, as it is singular in itself. Oswestry, in Shropshire, as we have seen, was the original seat of Alan on the Welsh border. Clune, in Shropshire, was added to this family by the marriage of his son, William, who built Clune Castle, and John Fitzalan, Lord of Clune and Oswestry, by marrying Isabel, the second sister of William de Albany, the third Earl of Arundel, who died in 1196, became Earl of Arundel and changed his residence from Shropshire to Sussex. Now, Richard Fitzalan, the Earl of Arundel, being with Edward III in Scotland during the year 1335 and claiming to be Stuart of Scotland by hereditary right, sold his title and claimed to Edward III for a thousand marks. But Richard Fitzalan had not any right to the Stuarts of, of Scotland. So that's a good one. You, you, you sell your right and you never had it in the first place. So you're just up a thousand marks. Sounds like con men. Walter, who was the first purchaser of this hereditary office, was the younger brother of William, son of Alan, the progenitor of Richard Fitzalan, the claimant. Until all the descendants of the first purchaser had failed, the claim could not ascend to the common father of the two families. But Robert, the Stuart, who was born of Marjorie Bruce on the 2nd of March 1315-16 and became King of Scots on the 22nd of February 1370-71 under the entail of the crown, was then in possession of the hereditary office of Stuart by lineal descent. Ah. <sighs> Walter, the son of Alan, undoubtedly obtained from David I and from his successor, Malcolm IV, great possessions, a high office and extensive patronage. And it may be reasonably asked by what influence he could acquire from two kings so much opulence and such an office. David I was a strenuous supporter of the claims of his niece, the Empress Maud, in her severe contest with Stephen. William, the brother of Walter, Influenced by the Earl of Gloucester, the bastard son of Henry I and the powerful partisan of his sister, the Empress, seized Shrewsbury in September 1139 and held it for her interest. He attended her with King David at the siege of Winchester in 1141, where they were overpowered by the Londoners and obliged to flee. 
Such then were the bonds of connection between David I and the sons of Alan, who were also patronised patronized by the Earl of Gloucester. It was probably on that occasion that Walter accompanied David into Scotland. It's funny how all these families began, these famous Scottish families began when they came into Scotland with David I from England, and they were all Normans. With David I and Henry II with Malcolm IV, when Walter, by those influences, obtained grants of Renfrew with other lands and founded the monastery of Paisley for Clinaic monks from Wenlock, he was followed by several persons from Shropshire who he enriched and by whom he was supported. I'm just going to have a little drink, guys. Walter married Eshina of Mall in Roxburghshire, by whom he had a son, Alan, who succeeded him in his estates and office when he died in 1177. Six descents carried this family by lineal transmission to Robert the Stuart, whose office was purchased by Edward III and became King of Scots in 1371. Walter, the son of Alan, was followed by his brother Simon, who was a progenitor of the family of Boyd, if we may believe the gene genealogists. Walter was also followed by other persons from Shropshire who appear more distinctly on the pages of history. A younger son of Montgomery, the great Earl of Shrewsbury, obtained a settlement from Walter, the son of Alan, in Renfrewshire. The, the, the aggrandizement of the Montgomerys was owing to the marriage of Sir John Montgomery to the heiress of Sir Hugh Eglinton, who died under Robert II. Robert Crock obtained from Walter, the son of Alan, a grant of lands which were called Crockton. After the proprietor, he founded some chapels and a hospital and he witnessed many charters of Walter, his chief. His blood and estates were carried by a female heir into the family of Stuart, Earl of Lennox. Several other families of English descent settled in Renfrew as vassals of the Stuarts. So it's, the Stuarts came in and brought in all these English families. Walter, the son of Alan, who enjoyed from the mis m munificent grant of the Scottish king the territory of Inner Inverwick in East Lothian, and there the first Stuart and his son Alan settled several vassals of English lineage. And the Stuarts, who possessed Kyle Stuart from the royal grant, planted there several colonists of foreign lineage. So the Stuarts are bringing in colonists of foreign lineage during the reigns of William and of Alexander II replacing the Gaelic people and there's been that's, it's been gone ever since um, even the potato famine and the, the, the removal of the crofters it's all connected to these Stuarts removing the Gaelic there's been a there's been a campaign by the Stuarts to remove the Gaelic race the Stuarts had the honour to patronise the progenitors of the illustrious Wallace. So here we go, guys. Wallace. Do you want to find out more about Wallace? Let me know in the comments and I'll read to you the lineage of this man. Okay, people. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you in the next video. Cheers. Hello guys and welcome back to another part of this video and I can't really wait to to listen in the comments about Wallace. I'm going to tell you anyway and it's, it's going to break a lot of Wallace fanboy's hearts and it kind of broke my heart as well like thinking that this guy was probably a full blooded Scot and when you, the further you dig into his family he's just the same as the rest of them. He's connected to Normans and it even goes as far as to say that the Crawfords where his family is connected to the Crawfords from Scotland were connected to Roman legionaries that that were abandoned in Britain and they, they kind of settled in that part of Scotland down south and Thor Longson who was a king who retreated north during the, the Norman um, invasion he kind of settled amongst them and it's so there was, there was like Danish blood there was like Roman but so all these different blood types mixed up down there uh, even Wales is mentioned as you'll here and here, so I was like, so, what's so Scottish about this William Wallace character? 
uh, even his name Wallace, it's it means Welsh or Welshman. Uh, so sorry, guys, and all those Braveheart fans, but <laughs> these people were for themselves and for each other. They were nobles. They were marrying into each other. They didn't care about the, the common man. That's what people forget about these these stories. The common man. You never hear about what happened to them. They were living on the land. They were living on the lands of these nobles. These Wallaces, these Bruces, and they were thrown at the front of the battles. And most of the Scotland's Scottish men have been wiped out because of these people. Anyway, and their petty wars. Anyway, back to the back to the book Caledonia by George Chalmers. And if if you're a big Wallace fanboy, put the fingers in the ears now, right? Right, guys. Cheers. The Stuarts had the honour to patronise the progenitors of the illustrious Wallace. The original country of this great man's family is idly supposed to be Wales, but his progenitors under the form of Wallens or Whaleys was undoubtedly an Anglo-Norman family who settled under the Stuarts in Ayrshire and Renfrew. Richard Wallens, who appears as a witness to the charters of Walter, the son of Alan, the first of the Stuarts, acquired lands in Kyle, where he settled and named the place Rickartun, which is now the name of a village and a parish in Ayrshire, it's called Rickerton. And this territory was held by Richard Wallance and his posterity under the Stuarts, till this family came to the throne. It's funny how it's all connected, the Bruce's, the Wallace, the Stuarts, they're all one big happy family. Um. Till this family came to the throne when the Wallaces of Rickerton became the tenants in chief. Richard Wallace, the first the first settler, so his name was Wallace, was succeeded by his son Richard, who lived contemporary with Alan, the son of Walter, the Stuart. And the second so they lived at the same time. The second Richard Wallace was succeeded by his son Richard, who lived at the same time with second Walter the Stuart and his son Alexander some of whose charters he witnessed. At the ascension of Robert II, Wallace of Rickerton acquired the neighbouring estate of Craigie by marrying the heiress of Lindsay of Craigie. And Lindsay, you'll, you'll notice a guest that comes on my, my hangouts in Conan. Uh, he, he's, he's, he knows lots about the Lindsay family. And they're all connected with this and connected world power and these powerful families and the royal families. Um, and this is who's ruling us today, I'm afraid. These people, all these families that I mentioned now, this is who run, runs the world. Lindsay of Craigie. Another branch of the family of Wallens took root in Renfrewshire under the kindly influences of the Stuarts. Henry Wallens, who was probably a younger son of Richard Wallens, held some lands in Renfrewshire under Walter, the Stuart, in the early part of the 13th century. Henry Wallens was probably the father of Aidan, who, in the reign of Alexander II, was connected with Walter, the Stuart. And this is what I was saying before. This is like, when was it? What was the date there? 13th century. When, when I say that Edward I had more claim to the land, in Scotland, England, Britain in general, uh, I mean that when I say his families were in Britain long before the Wallaces, long before the Stuarts and the Bruces. Maybe they got in there and married higher up, like I say, but even they, they didn't. Because uh, th those lineages were well, well gone. They were, they were, they were, they were, they were trying to mop up the the leftovers of the lineages, the females. Uh, but Edward the First, his his family was well established for hundreds of years in Britain, well before these people. Um, so it's like who who do you want ruled by? This posh guy or this posh guy? Because these two posh guys, the both. They claim to be from different countries, but they both speak the same language. They both have more common than any, anybody else. It's, it's the same what's happening today. Like with these these powers, these like Putins and um, Bidens can come in against each other, but they've got more in common with each other than they have with us, the peasantry. And these fanboys need to remember this. Henry Wallace was probably the father of Adam, who in the reign of Alexander II was connected with Walter, the Stuart, and this Adam was probably the father of Malcolm Whaley's, who was the father of Sir William Whaley's of Ellerslie, the celebrated champion of his country's independence. 
So he was Sir William Wallace of Ellerslie. He was the father of William Wallace. Malcolm Wallace. In this character, he came out upon the stage in May 1297 to contend with Edward I for the liberty of Scotland. He was successful in many a conflict. His successes raised him to the guardian of the kingdom and the leader of our armies. He freed his country, but he was enfeebled by envy and in the end was subdued by perfidy. And perfidy, this is a word uh, I had to look up. It means uh, deceit and sneaking behind his back was subdued by perfidy. August 1305, this magnanimous man fell under the axe of Edward I, whose sword could never subdue him. He left no legitimate issue, but he had a natural daughter who married Sir William Bailey of Hoprig, the progenitor of the Bailey of Lamington. So, so there we go, that was the, the lineage of William Wallace, who, just like the rest of them, was a Norman, just like the rest of them, has English roots. Uh, and the next family are the Douglases. So, I'll end it there. <laughs>